we are officially back to Food for Sustainability webinars. Welcome to, to all. Uh, we'll start today discussion around sustainable proteins. Okay, and this time we'll bring you an overview on the protein timeline, the present and the future. And here we'll be dealing with protein related opportunities in terms of business. By now you should know me, I'm Claudia Costa, I'm the coordinator of Food for Sustainability Academy, uh, which is the area where we disseminate knowledge through educational programs, capacitation, awareness raising, with the goal to, to get more informed and educated audience around our focus areas. And our focus areas, you should know by now that uh, they, they, they cover the topics of circular economy, sustainable farming, ecosystem services, functional nutrition, and of course, entrepreneurial uh, activities towards more sustainable and healthy food systems. So again, welcome everyone. People are still joining. Uh, let me, I have to, to acknowledge that these webinars would not be possible without my very committed team, which I very briefly present with no special order, probably alphabetic order. So we have with us Daniela Fonseca, um, PhD in Sustainable Chemistry. Hello, Daniela, can you wave at us? Yes, hello. We also have Rita Silva. She's a microbiologist. Hello, Rita. Give us a wave. Great. And last but not least, Silvia Moreira, PhD in food science. Give us a wave. Hello. And all together, we'll be here to assist you throughout the session. Okay. And just before I present uh, our distinguished speakers, let me just remind you that these sessions are recorded. So please, if you do not wish to appear, please remain with your cameras off. Of course, questions are also welcome. We will use a dedicated uh, chat uh, for that. Uh, Silvia will put the Slido link in just a couple of minutes and you are more than welcome to contribute with the questions and comments and opinions and uh, just making sure that we have an interesting and round discussion on the topics. So now it's time for us to, to get to know our distinguished speakers. And I think Rita has a slide uh, for us with that. So we will start with Tamsin Baxter um, and, uh, and, and Tamsin will be presenting the primary nutrient. What can cultural history of proteins teach us about the current moment? And just a couple of words about Tamsin. She's a researcher and a writer at table. Her background is in social and historic linguistic and linguistic geography. Tamsin did a bachelor's at University of Essex, uh, a master's at Oxford and a PhD in linguistics at Cambridge. Uh, this was followed by a research fellowship at Gunville and Caius College in Cambridge in which she worked on understanding how spatial processes determine the big pic picture of language change, such as how changing migration habits led to the disappearance of dialect diversity. She's interested in making and transmission of cultural meaning and its attachments to place and habits of living. Tamsin, thank you so much for being here and a warm welcome. Next, uh, we will have Anne-Maria Pachari. We'll be discussing the benefits and challenges related to the transition towards more plant-based diets. And Anne-Marie uh, works as an associate professor in molecular nutrition and is uh, the principal investigator for several research projects at the Department of Food and Nutrition, University of Helsinki in Finland. And Marie is uh, particularly interested in revealing the molecular mechanisms by which diets, foods, and diet-derived compounds mediate their effects on health and prevention of non-communicable diseases. The main focus is on gut uh, physi physiology, 
meta metabolism and microbiota, as well as on protein nutrition and bioavailability. She's interested in uh, the effects of plant-based foods, berries, and their polyphenols, as well as dietary proteins on the health and the develop of chronic diseases, including collateral cancer. She's also keen in supporting the transition towards more sustainable food systems. Thank you so much. And uh, Anne-Marie, you're very aligned with the mission here of Food for Sustainability, also this, this important transition. So after Anne-Marie, we will have the pleasure of having with us Ivan uh, Stefanik, which we will be guiding us on how to finance and commercialize novel sustainable uh, proteins. Very interesting because Ivan is a business development and technology transfer specialist with more than 30 years of international experience in research and business. Since to, uh, 2013, he is the European IP Help Desk Ambassador. Ivan has also founded and is the executive director of Terra Technopolis, which was established in 2002. Ivan is also involved in several EU strategic initiatives, such as the European Enterprise Network, Erasmus for Young uh, Entrepreneurs, and the EIT Food. Even signature program, Be the Role Model, was the national winner in European Entrepreneurship Promotion Award under the category Promoting Entrepreneurial Skills. And in the following year, it was also uh, the winner in the category on Investing in Entrepreneurial Skills. So even really knows what he's talking about. He's also a full professor at the Faculty of Agrobiotechnical Science at Ozijek. I need your, your help here with the pronunciation even in the field of economics and entrepreneurship in agribusiness and the leader of the research group Agriculture and Resource Economics and Entrepreneurship. Even his passion about the gamification of learning experience, mentoring students and young entrepreneurs and enterprising university. Also, even thank you so much for being here. OK, so now we know who our speakers are and we just before we start, we would like to test your knowledge on the topics that we are covering. So we are going to invite all the participants uh, to join us in Slido. OK, so Sylvia very kindly has put up uh the the web address so if you can type just www.slido.com and then you enter uh just the hashtag is already there but uh, f or s academy you will see that we have a couple of questions prepared for you sylvia can i have a thumbs up when the questions are ready. Okay. It's not showing in my screen, Sylvia. Is it showing in yours? No, Tamsin is saying no. Okay, so we have here the first question and this question is really the expertise of Tamsin. So the daily amount of proteins intake for adults was set in 2007 by FAO at 0.83 grams per kilo per day. How do you think this amount has evolved over the past? So let me vote here. Do you think it has increased, decreased? It stayed about the same? Okay, people are voting, so still voting. Just a couple of more seconds. And Stamsin, apparently we have a clear winner. Apparently our audience is knowledgeable about the topic. More than half of our participants say that in the past, um, this amount has increased. Are they right, Stamson? Let's see. 
well, okay, I mean, do you, you want will to have, wait and yeah, yes, we, we will have talk. a very interesting <laughs> presentation, and Tamsin has very interesting figures to show you and to share you on how things have evolved, and you might be surprised with what's coming. Okay, so then our next question. Our next question relates to what is a healthy and sustainable diet as the one presented by the Planetary Healthy Diet. Again, this is the expertise of Anne Maria that has done a lot of work and um, it Lancet proposed three types of diets that they have researched and um, uh, uh, concluded that these were the most healthy and sustainable diets. Are we talking a flexi uh, flexitarian diet, a vegan diet, or a protein-based diet? As we can see, apparently we have a lot of consensus about uh, what constitutes a sustainable and healthy diet. But some people also believe that vegan and protein-based uh, protein diets also play a role. Let's try to see, but my guess is that uh, Anne Maria, our participants are right, correct? But we'll know a little bit more about this uh, in the coming minutes. Thank you. And finally, one last question. How much do you think the protein market is, is expected to be worth in 2030? This is the the um, the expertise of even even you'll probably correct us here. Um, so that's uh, a, a split here. Let's see if uh, um, if this comes to to some other uh, figures. Are we all voting? Okay, that's an interesting. So we have here. Well, we have here to start with a very big market. So there's a lot of money on the table to be grabbed by looking more at proteins and what are sustainable proteins. But apparently the majority of our audience thinks that this market is worth $162 billion, a lot of money. And according to our research, this is the correct answer. Hopefully, uh, Ivan will Ivan will will guide us through. You know how big this market opportunity. So we have here uh, uh, points for learning. Thank you so much for joining us with this uh, with this voting. Uh, most of you are absolutely right, but some of you will will have um, new knowledge coming to your direction. Let me just tell you that we have the on Slido, the Q&A answer. So please write your questions and we will um, try to address your question to the speaker after after the, 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 the presentation. The, the, um, the Slido will be open throughout the entire session. Thank you so much. That's all for me, Tamsin. The floor is now yours. You can start and share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. Um, is this visible to everybody? Can everybody see this? Yes, perfect. Great. OK, so yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about the cultural history of protein and that might seem maybe off topic for people who are engaged in the current research. Um, about the future and about what technology is present, but I hope to persuade you that it is relevant to think about the past and the cultural context to understand how we can best um, use our knowledge as we move into the future. So, uh, as Claudia mentioned, I work for Table and we're an organisation that explores how uh, cultural context and values and ideologies shape debates about food and perhaps sometimes prevent us um, result using the, the best evidence, the best tools that the research can give us in practice in society. 
And I've been working on the history of protein um, for much of the past year, and we've, we've brought a paper on out, out on this recently, which I'll give you a reference to at the end. But I'll start by, start by talking about what the point of exploring the history of protein is. So you might have come across the phrase, the charismatic nutrient. So this is a phrase that um, the researcher, the historian on the history of international development, Aya Kimura, um, coined. And it's what she describes as the nutrient which comes to command the centre of the political stage in conversations about food. And there have been different moments in the past where different nutrients have really dominated our both popular and expert conversations about food. But I think you'll probably agree with me that right now it is very clear that protein is the charismatic nutrient of the moment. So protein is overwhelmingly present in food advertising, as you can see from these images around the edge here. Um, but it's also, it dominates in non-expert discussions of diet and dieting. And you can see that in things like the popularity of the paleo diet and the keto diet. It, um, it features very heavily in expert discussions of various health issues like aging and sarcopenia, obesity and satiety and sports nutrition. And of course, the topic that we're perhaps most interested in, it is um, a very central part of conversations about the future of the food system and the possibility of a protein transition as a way of reaching a more sustainable way of producing food. Now, not all of this discourse in different spheres, professional and popular, is entirely consistent with each other. And we will, and that, that will maybe become relevant as, as we go through this. But the point that I think is particularly, that really struck me when I started exploring the history of protein is none of this is new. There actually have been periods in the past which look remarkably like the present moment in terms of the role that protein played in discourse about food. Um, so these adverts that you see on the screen now, most of this, these are from the period 1900 to 1910. Um, some of them are from the period 1950-ish to 1970, which are the other two big periods when protein was the charismatic nutrient, was the centre of conversations about food and about the future of food and about food science. So those two periods, um, the first one covers from the late 19th century to the early 20th century. The second, which is generally referred to by researchers as the great protein fiasco, um, that, that covered from about 1955 to 1974. And in retrospect, both of these were bubbles, a bit like um, stock market bubbles. These were moments when people's ideas about protein became overinflated. Um, and though really useful research came out of both periods. There were also kind of excesses, wasted efforts, which were directed in the wrong direction. And there was a mismatch between popular belief and the best science. And so what I want to ask is how can we learn from these periods to make sure the same doesn't happen again today? So I'll talk about these two periods um, a little bit each, and then I'll draw some lessons. So starting with that first period, so we're talking the late 19th century, and um, the, the dates on this one are a bit vague, but say 1880 to 1914 or 15. So a relevant bit of background here is that protein was first named, I'm not gonna say discovered, but first named in 1837 um, by a Dutch scientist, called uh, Gerrit Mulder, and Mulder um, believed that he had discovered a single chemical, one compound, which was the basis of all human nutrition, so that not only were all tissues built out of this uh, compound, in, in fact, not only humans, but all animals and plants, but also it was the only source of energy for all muscle movement and so on. And so he called it protein from the Greek for supreme nutrient or primary nutrient. Now that idea of one nutrient, of one compound, had been abandoned by the 1880s, the kind of period where I'm starting to talk about here. But that idea still was very present in the backs of people's minds. The idea, it was still transparent to people that the word protein meant primary. Um, and there was a belief that this was the primary nutrient in, in human nutrition. In fact, it was often referred to as the nutritive component of food, the part of food which gave you sustenance. 
So in this period, the estimates of the nutritional requirement for protein were way higher than today. So that's that uh, quiz question at the beginning. Um, typical estimates in this period were between one and a half to two grams per kilo of body weight per day. So I have a slide on that. I should have put this in here. But the red dots in this here, these are the estimates for protein requirement in this period. And today you can see the red dots. These are adult requirements. Um, today, so they were about twice as high or a bit higher in the late 19th century. Um, the thing about believing that you need to get two grams of protein per kilo of body weight per day to be healthy is basically the only way to achieve that is to eat a lot of lean meat. Um, you really need to eat a lot of high, very high protein foods to do that. And that reinforced the popular belief that meat was the most important and most healthsome food, which was popular among the white, wealthy Western men who were doing this research. So there was this feedback loop in scientific research where patterns of public consumption, particularly among white Westerners and particularly among wealthy people, um, informed scientific findings. They prompted researchers to think what uh, what hypotheses were worth testing and they influenced what seemed plausible, what results seemed plausible. And so because they believed that meat was so implausible, it was so plausibly important, it seemed very likely that protein was was central to nutrition. That led to dietary recommendations for very high amounts of protein and those changed patterns of public consumption, which in turn fed back into scientific findings. And there are some amazing examples of this, my favourite of which is um, the head of the USDA, Wilbur Atwater, in the late 1890s, published the first recommendations for protein intake that the USDA ever published. And he based them on the amount of protein that athletes at, um, at Yale ate. Now, athletes at Yale, he believed, were the ultimate subjects for study because they were doing a lot of exercise, so they had very demanding lives, but they also had a lot of money so they could eat whatever their bodies needed. And he was missing the fact that their coaches had read the German research, which said that you needed a lot of meat and a lot of protein, and so they were being told to eat a lot of meat by their coaches. And so you see these direct feedback loops, which led to the inflation in beliefs about how much protein you had to eat. Then in the 1890s, uh, refined protein powders were invented and that led to the popularization of protein supplements and protein fortified foods as health foods. And those are the adverts I showed you earlier, a lot of these. Um, so things like Procea here, um, the uh, Binogen in the top left hand corner. These are all foods that were fortified with protein that were being sold as health foods and that might ring a bit true. That might be a bit familiar if you walk into the supermarket now. So how did this end? Because obviously this didn't continue throughout the rest of the 20th century. And what happened is basically that huge contrast between the po policies of different nations during the war created very clear evidence that those require those estimates of the human protein requirement were wrong. Countries like Germany, which believed in those very high protein requirements and privileged livestock agriculture as part of their wartime food policy, had enormous famines. Countries like Denmark, which actually banned feeding animals anything that humans could in theory eat and ended up feeding humans a lot of animal feed and culling a lot of animals, they had they had no famines and they actually had increases in public health during the war. So that demonstrated very convincingly to, to science that protein requirements were much lower. But the important thing I want you to draw your attention to is that all the evidence for this had been there way earlier. So the basics of protein theory, this idea that protein was responsible for all muscular um, energetic activity had been disproven as early as 1866. So way before this period even happened. It was just still vaguely believed in the zeitgeist, even though a, a scientist being really careful would have acknowledged it wasn't, it couldn't be strictly true. There were also experimental, there was also experimental evidence as early as 1904, showing that it was possible to live a healthy life on a low protein vegetarian diet. So you can see that here, there's this one recommendation well before the end of this period, well before the war. And if that had been acted upon by all these countries which had, like Germany, when they came to their wartime food policy, then many thousands of lives could have been saved. So that's 
that's that early period. And I'm going to talk much more briefly about the 1950s through 70s. So this is a period in which we're talking here more or less about um, the what was going on among nutritional scientists and more what was going on in governments and international development agencies. So this is a period in which most NGO and aid agency resources that were trying to solve the problem of world hunger were directed at trying to create high-tech new protein foods. So a huge amount of work in this period went into trying to create single-cell proteins, cultivated protein foods. Um, they were doing this because they believed on the basis of their calculations from the infant protein requirement that A, infant protein malnutrition was the biggest problem in world health, and B, the um, predicted overpopulation of the world that was coming as populations rose was going to lay, lead to a food crisis, and that food crisis was primarily going to be about too little protein. And this period ended in 1974 with the publishing of a paper by Don McLaren entitled The Great Protein Fiasco, in which McLaren pointed out that none of these projects had done any good, basically. They had spent a long time trying to create protein out of oil, because crude oil was very cheap at the beginning of this period. By the end of this period, crude oil was very expensive, and so those technologies were useless. They had created a lot of very high-tech foods which couldn't usefully be transported to the poor places where problems of hunger existed. Um, and none of these projects had resulted in solving the problem of world hunger. But crucially, it is also the case that, again, dietary requirement numbers had been updated so the science had improved and changed during this period, but the conclusions were ignored. So the blue dots here, same graph again, the blue dots are the infant protein requirement. And you can see that in 1955, people believed that the human infant required four grams of protein per kilo of body mass. Notice that that means that even breast milk is protein deficient. <laughs> so these are pretty extreme numbers. By the middle of this period, those, those estimates were coming down as the science improved. And yet that didn't cause anyone to revisit the models that were directing all of these aid agency and government research programs. In both this period and the previous period, it is also the, po the point that a lot of money and capital was already invested in these solutions. And so people were resistant to the idea that they might be based on simplistic science. I mean, there were, there were good insights in these periods and some of this technology is now um, being revisited and feeding into modern technological revolutions, which are valuable. And some valuable technologies, successful technologies came out of this, like corn microprotein. But the majority of this was maybe chasing overly simple solutions. So what should we learn for the present day? Now, I'm not going to say that we're wrong to be pursuing high tech proteins as potential solutions or changes in how we get our protein as potential solutions to the um, to the environmental impacts of food. I think the, the, the science does point in that direction right now. But we have to be cautious that that feels right to us. It feels logical because of the connections of protein to these highly symbolic foods like meat and like dairy, which are very important foods in our cultures. It feels logical that it should just turn out that protein is the answer. And whenever something feels intuitive and feels logical and good, we have to be really careful that we don't get kind of mesmerized and overly convinced by it. We have to keep an eye on the big picture, be willing to, willing to change strategies when the basic science progresses and be willing to pursue complicated equivocal strategies with many strands rather than just focusing on the single um, most the single simplest solution which is most easy to um, to commercialize um, that's that's basically my takeaway but if you're interested to hear more about this uh, roughly the story I've told you today you can have a look at our piece on the table website where does protein get its power if you'd like to know way more about this. You can read the much longer paper uh, that we published um, at the end of last year, Primed for Power, A Short Cultural History of Protein, and I've got the DOI there, and I hope we can share the link to these slides at the end of this session. Um, but yeah, thanks very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions you've got. Tamsin, fantastic. Thank you so much for such an interesting insights on uh, uh, the the history of proteins and there are so much resembles 
with what we what is happening uh, today and it really tells us the importance of history and how can we learn from from the past let me just double check the chat apparently uh, we don't have a question so i'll just ask uh, a question and i have to say I, i recommend everyone to read it's not such a long paper actually and it's quite easy to read and it's quite fun and uh, we all kind of um, review ourselves in in this uh, two, 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 200 years of, of history. So Tamsin, one question uh, from me. So in your historical review, you highlight several parallels um, between the, the, the current interest uh, in pro proteins. Uh, something that I, I found also quite fascinating is that the same discourse that we have today about sustainable agriculture and this um, ability to, to feed the growing population was also held for proteins in the mid 20th century. And at this, that time, also technology kicked in and, and started to offer solutions, but very few survived uh, to these dates. Can you identify uh, any parallel between the developments of the mid 90s and what is happening today? And what are your recommendations so that we make sure that we align these motives of profit, profit seeker, entrepreneurs and policy makers and food policies and public health? What is the, the equilibrium so that can we have scientists that are entrepreneurs, should scientists be kept away from the for profit market? So what are your views? Oh, this is this is a tricky and complicated question because I can point easily to I could point easily to all the kind of the bad stories, the way things went wrong. But that's not to say that there isn't a great deal of good done by scientists who are also entrepreneurs. I suppose I would say so to start with that last question. Um, entrepreneurial science is great in some senses because scientists are the people who are closest to have the most intimate knowledge, know where it is possible to push technology where the next advances are going to come. That's fantastic. It is just important that we are also able to keep separate the basic science so that the incentives of entrepreneurial science don't end up skewing the results of basic science. If you're if you're if you will make more money, if you get one result from your experiment and you will make less money if you get another result, it is very hard I mean, I have all the sympathy in the world to people in that position. It is very hard to to be fully um, to be fully act fully neutrally in that situation. But yeah, in terms of parallels between these two periods, um, yeah, the there is a certain kind of I th one might refer to it as a Malthusian discourse, um, which is to say a fear of the damage we are going to do to the world as our populations continue to increase um, through the way we feed ourselves that really structures a lot of our thinking about the future, both now and then. And it's not to say that it, that people weren't right then. Um, it's just, and, and in a, you know, because one, one thing you could come away from that period and say is that, oh, okay, everyone was wrong. We did manage to feed everybody. There was no single great moment of hunger crisis. But on the other hand, the technologies that were created to feed everybody, the Green Revolution, um, have created the environmental crisis that we now find ourselves in or contributed to it. So that's that's a huge parallel and the focus on protein is very striking in both periods. One thing I would say that I think is a useful lesson coming out of how that discourse fed into scientific work and that fed into commercial projects in that period and this one is that very little attention was paid in that period to um, to the social contexts of the technologies people were trying to create. So people would, fight, would say, oh, there are children starving in very poor rural places in Africa and India. Um, we believe they're not getting enough protein. The solution is we have to create, we have to find some way of getting them more protein. Where have we got cheap sources of protein? Well, the, these industries in the US are creating byproducts. Maybe we can turn that into protein. The problem is that that was only ever going to create foods which were completely unfamiliar to the people they were trying to help, which didn't look like foods to them, um, and were also, frankly, too expensive and on the wrong side of the world. <laughs> um, and it's that kind of attention to the social context and more attention to 
how are you going to actually achieve behavior change? How are you going to get this to the people who need it cheaply enough? That's actually the center of the problem, much more than the technology is the center of the problem. Um, and I think the same, that, that, that feels to me like an important lesson for now. Yes, and we are not willing to give up our tasty food, right? We always want to make sure that it still tastes properly, right? Um, exactly. Jansen, thank you so much. We have here um, two questions. Um, do you think that the change of having alternative source of protein can help the increase of non-animal protein? Samson, you muted yourself. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, hopeful. <laughs> Thanks. I'm hopeful that it will. I'm hopeful that it will because I do. I am personally relatively convinced by the evidence that that's what we need to do. Um, I'm concerned, though, by some of the evidence that at least in some places, it seems that the increase in alternative meats and meat imitation products is largely replacing plant foods in people's diets and not replacing, not yet replacing um, meat. Now that isn't happening in all markets, um, but I think again it comes back to what I just said basically. I think we need to pay a lot of attention to the sociology. Mm -hmm. How do we get people to change their diets? Um, rather than necessarily thinking that the that the solution to the problem is mostly about inventing new foods. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we are still always dealing with the consumer behavior and in the end it's the responsibility of us all to make sure that uh, these changes uh, happen. That's plenty of, of questions, but I, I think, uh, Daniela, do apolog apologize me, but I think I will take this question to move on to, to Anne-Maria Anne because Anne-Maria did a lot on, uh, on on changing and the trade-offs between uh, uh, animal uh, protein-based diet and plant-based diet. I'll get back to these questions later on at the webinar. So Tenzin, if you can stay with us a little bit more. Um, uh, Anne-Maria, welcome. I now hand the, the, the floor to you. You're feel, to, feel free to, to share your screen. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can uh, see my slide in presenting mode. Working good. perfectly, thank you. Right, good. So, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to to have a talk here. And uh, yeah, the, the first talk was really fascinating. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope <laughs> mine is is uh, a, a, little, a little bit uh, as good uh, as that one. Anyway, uh, so. Um, I will talk about benefits and challenges related to the transition towards more plant protein based diets. Uh, and if we think about plant proteins, they, of course, they are not only protein sources, but, uh, even though they are, of course, that, uh, but they come with other dietary uh, comp com com components as well. So, for example, they are usually excellent sources of dietary fiber. Uh, the, the fat content is rather low and the fat is of good quality. Also, the energy content is moderate or low, uh, which might be good for, for this uh, when we have this uh, uh, prevalent, high prevalence of, of overweight and uh, obesity. Uh, plant protein sources are usually high in folate. Uh, and depending on the source, they also contain other vitamins such as carotenoids and vitamin K. Um, however, we might have some challenges in, in, uh, in nutrition-wise. So even though protein content is good, uh, amino acid composition may be low in one or several essential amino acids and typically legumes are low in sulfur containing amino acids and uh, and grains low in lysine, for example. So it's uh, important that uh, that we combine different plant protein sources so that we can cover all all our needed amino acids. Uh, plant protein con uh, protein sources also contain some anti nutrients. 
such as tannins, phytate, protease inhibitors, and so forth, which may interfere or reduce bioaccessibility and bioavailability of some nutrients, including proteins, uh, iron, zinc, and calcium. So uh, the, we need to, uh, when we think about uh, protein transition uh, diet-wise, we need to be aware that what happens to overall nutrient intakes and uh, really give give uh, so that we know that if we need to make some uh, correcting moves, for example. So my group has been interested in uh, in seeing what really happens with uh, dietary intake and. Uh, and also with biomarkers of, of uh, uh, chronic diseases, when we when we change diet from mostly animal based uh, animal protein based diet towards more plant based diet, and we have carried out two uh, two uh, randomized control trials, uh, the Senopar trial and the Beanman trial, and. Uh, the idea I, I present some results of these these trials within the time frame I've been given. Um, uh, we had two ideas here in the Skenopper trial. We took all animal protein sources and uh, replaced uh, them partly with plant sourced proteins, uh, and then we had this Beanman trial where we only uh, took red red and processed meat and then replaced part of them with legume based foods uh, so uh, i'll i'll just give you some glimpses or hints what happened so uh, first uh, first of all about scanopra trial um, where we had three diet groups uh, the first one uh, representing current Finnish diet, where 70% of uh, proteins come from animal sources and 30% from plant sources, and that's mainly whole grains. Then we had 50-50 group, where we had 50% animal and 50% and plant protein sources, and then we had mostly plant protein source diet, 30% animal and 70% uh, plant-based protein sources. Uh, we actually we wanted to keep fish and egg uh, consumption same throughout all the uh, diets, and what we played at were, were red and white meat, and as well as dairy products, which were replaced with whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Uh, this was a rather very well controlled trial, so that we actually gave. 80% uh, of the total energy uh, as foods to the volunteers. So we tried to control all the protein sources and we had both men and women, more, more women than men, and this was a uh, three months uh, duration. Uh, and just, I'm, I'm not going to show you details. Okay, actually, I could say that uh, the 50-50 groups uh, group, we could say that we only see positive changes. But then in the most plant protein source diets, there were some results, there were very positive results in terms of, of uh, health and nutrient intakes. But then there were a couple of things that might uh, evoke some concern. So good things first. So we, we could see that with the replacement, uh, there were lower intake of saturated fat and cholesterol and higher intake of unsaturated fats um, and higher intake of dietary fiber, all very good things in, in uh, nutrient-wise. Then we could see that there were lower intakes of vitamin D, calcium, vitamin B12 and iodine, and these might be something we need to uh, be pay attention to in, in the future. And absolutely nothing happened with iron. So there were a decrease in animal-derived uh, iron intake, patterning uh, increase in plant-derived iron intake, meaning that in total iron, there was uh, nothing going on. And if we look at the uh, biomarkers for health, 
So uh, perhaps uh, related to the chains of uh, dietary fat content, we could see, uh, could, could see a decrease in total and LDL cholesterol, which might indicate a decreased risk for cardiovascular diseases. So very positive thing, as I think cardiovascular diseases are the ma major uh, cause for death in, in most of the Western world countries. Uh, then I could take the gut metabolism, which was where, where we could see really favorable changes. So there was a reduction in fecal and nitrous compound concentration in the stool samples in the most plant-based uh, dietary group. And n compounds are thought to uh, be the mediator of the increase increased risk of colorectal cancer by red and processed meat. So this is a really positive sign and perhaps means that there's a decrease in uh, risk for colorectal cancer. Then we could see some not so good changes. So there were enhanced turnover of, of bone tissue, um, which may be related to increased fracture risk. And there was a decreased serum B12 and urine iodine uh, which really we need to pay attention when, when doing dietary changes. So, and here I, I say that we, there were no um, supplement use was allowed by the volunteers because we wanted to see what happens when we change the diet and no, no supplements uh, have been taken. So I, I thought that uh, that's very important to emphasize here. So then we carried out uh, the Beanman trial uh, where we, only have had men because uh, because in Finland uh, men consume uh, about 760 grams of red and processed meat per week, which is nearly double what women women consume. And we wanted to that, that that's the reason we wanted to concentrate on men. Our uh, nutrition current nutrition recommendations uh, say that one should consume no more than 500 grams of red and processed meat per week, uh, meaning, and that, that's based on health reasons. So we took, we had here two, two uh, groups. Um, uh, the one who, who was receiving the 760 grams of red and processed meat per week, uh, equivalent to 25% of protein intake. And then another group where the red and processed meat intake was reduced to 200 grams of red and processed meat per week, uh, equivalent to 5% of protein intake. And now this is actually the uh, close to the upper limit recommended for red and processed meat uh, in, in a planetary health diet. So uh, the Eat Lancet diet recommendation. And, and this is now the really the uh, upper limit. Uh, and legumes, were introduced to legume and meat group so that they provided 20% of protein intake and they were mostly uh, pea and faba bean based products because we, we can grow pea, peas and faba bean in Finland. So we wanted to look at the local, local uh, uh, legumes we have in Finland. So this was uh, done with healthy working age men uh, and uh, the length was six weeks. So what we, we saw was that um, there was no change in protein, carbohydrate and fat intake, which was our intention. Uh, so I'm happy with this. But when we look at the uh, quality of fat, we could once more see that there's a clear decrease in saturated fatty acid intake and increase in monounsaturated and particularly in polyunsaturated fatty acid intakes. And, and these green areas you see are the Finnish uh, and or Nordic nutrition recommendations. So uh, currently we consume too much saturated fat uh, and with, with this replacement, we could reach or we could uh, at least have a move towards uh, recommended uh, levels. Um, and like in our Scanopro trial, we could see um, even this rather moderate change, we could see uh, a decrease in LDL cholesterol and, air, uh, and total cholesterol levels in the blood. Once again, perhaps indicating a lower risk for cardiovascular diseases. 
We could also see uh, that there's an increase in uh, uh, fiber intake so uh, with, with legumes. So th that's actually a quite clear intake around, uh, uh, if I think, uh, if I remember right, that was around seven uh, grams more fiber in the legume group than in the meat group. Uh, very, very uh, nice result. And once again, we could see that that there's a clear decrease in, in these carcinogenic and nitrosal compounds in the stool, once again, indicating a decreased risk for colorectal cancer. So uh, uh, tr I try to keep in, in my time slot, so uh, I, I go to summary. So um, first of all, when replacing animal sourced proteins with plant sourced ones, um, that, that leads both to positive and negative changes in nutrient intake status and disease biomarkers. Um, and uh, once again, I need to uh, emphasize that the milder replacement, about 20% of animal, uh, animal proteins, uh, only led to positive changes. But when we uh, when we move towards more plant-based diets or perhaps near vegan diets, then we really need to uh, pay attention to some of the nutrients such as uh, B12 and iodine, for example. So, uh, and I think this is uh, good to keep in mind because I think many vegans know that they need to take uh, B12 as, as pills, but, but if someone just sort of like trying a flexitarian diet and uh, ha happening to be actually quite near to vegan diet, there, there might be a need for uh, nutrient supplements. So I think that's good, good to be, uh, good to recognize and uh, yeah, consider actions to counterbalance. Uh, then when we do um, a much more moderate change, as we did with Beanman study and replaced red and processed meat with legume foods, and, we, they, and they kept their diets otherwise untouched, uh, then uh, we actually saw only positive changes in nutrient intakes and metabolic markers, uh, and at least health-wise, that, that, uh, that was a very, uh, very effective, even, even this sort of like rather moderate change. And uh, as red and processed meat do contribute to uh, uh, to uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, I would think that, that this was also more sustainable, even though we haven't yet uh, calculated the sustainability uh, effects here. Um, yeah, I, I thank you for your attention, and here are the um, teams that have worked for these interventions. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. And Maria, what a great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very, very um, interesting. And thank you also for the the, the openness uh, about, you know, the trade-offs that this the change in, in plants and, and, and uh, plant-based diets might uh, implicate because uh, there's lots of you know, argument that we all should go to a plant-based diet, but actually there's, uh, there, are, uh, there are also some downsides. And then and, and again, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, moving toward more local produce, adapting the diet to, 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 to cultural habits uh, and, you know, having all, all, all the, the consequences in terms of um, uh, other, other um, nutrients that we're missing. That, that was very helpful and very elucidative. Thank you so much. Um, there is a, a question here. If you, and Maria, could you provide us some information regarding how to overcome bioavailability and digestibility of plant proteins? This is also a huge problem. You know, what can we do to improve it? What technologies, what uh, is science, science saying about it to, to overcome this issue? Yes, that's uh, that's a hot question, actually, and uh, we have had an other intervention regarding fabapine protein bioavailability, for example. Uh, uh, yes, I think it's um, there are processes that could help, for example, fermentation 
is is one that will uh, get rid of, so let's say, some of the uh, uh, anti-nutrients. Uh, and also, um, fermentation might be good for getting rid of the gut symptom causing causing a uh, sort of like fiber component as well. So that that's one. And of course, I think it's important that the more plant-based food or diet we consume, it's it's good to pay attention that there are enough plant protein sources that that the uh, let's say the overall protein content is I would say um, safe and then we could we could afford that it's not digested so efficiently as as animal based uh, products. So the current recommendation, at least in Finland and, and in Nordic countries, uh, for protein intake is between 10 to 20 in energy percent. So I would say that with, with if, if one follows a very plant-based diet, I would aim at around at least 15 energy percent of protein. So it's good to look at having a variety of plant protein sources, mixing them and uh, then I don't think it's uh, it's so uh, how I would say detrimental if if not all the protein is digested. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's helpful because this is actually a big concern from from those that look more closely the plant based diets. Uh, we also have a question here, uh, which I think you kind of touched upon. Um, uh, in your presentation, but probably you can elaborate a little bit more. So what is the best way to overcome the nutritional needs left from a plant-based diet? How can we supplement it? Yes, this is actually a bit, I would say, a political question, depending what 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 are the um, the um, the um, let's say governmental parties or so uh, what sort of a, like approaches they take? Because of course, uh, when we think uh, think plant-based foods at the market, many of them are actually supplemented with B12 or, or fortified with B12 or or vitamin D or iodine, uh, and particularly uh, those used to replace milk usually ha have been fortified with with iodine and b12 and i think that's that's fair enough and and good of course there are there are then the individual actions we can take so that we'll just for sure take 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 a, a tablet from a, you know like a like a really real uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, supplement I'm I'm not quite sure as a nutritionist I would like that all the nutrients would come from the diet but of course people are let's say vegan they are vegans for many reasons so uh it's partly a philosophical question as well but at least uh, if I would follow a very plant based diet I would use the plant foods that are fortified with with B12 and and iodine for example that's a great recommendation. Thank you. May I ask a question, uh, Anne Maria? Um, so <laughs> I'm curious about. So based on your research, and uh, you, we mentioned here the the planetary health diet that was presented by the Eat Lancet Commission, but we still know that this is a very theoretical reference and that still lacks some 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 evidence from your research. What would be your recommendations? What what factors do we need to take in consideration to make this actually a, vi a, um, um, a viable um, health diet? Uh, what sort of things we need to take in consideration? Is it the uh, the, the local diet, the seasonality, the the dietary habits? You know, what mm -hmm. factors do you think need to still be looked at for this to be? Yeah, yes, a uh, oh, great question <laughs> uh, and not very easy to answer. So I I do believe that we need to have a wider approach and think, think let's say, like a sustainability as a whole. And uh, also, um, I think um, if we want be people to eat more sustainable, so sustainable diets or follow more sustainable diets, I think if we really want to have an impact, 
uh, we should get as much people uh, on board as possible. So it won't help much if, let's say, one percent of of uh, Finns will change their dietary habits and the others will go on as they have done this far. So I really think that we should uh, promote uh, changes that are, that are achievable in in uh, in what whatsoever local food culture, so that as many of as possible could adapt at least some aspect of sustainability. So perhaps others could be make a bigger changes, and those who are not willing to make very large changes, it would help if they would do like a more moderate change. So I. And I think um, that we change this happens, uh, really happen really slowly. So um, I think it's very important to take the local culture and local food uh, food uh, at market into account and try to build on what what is um, what is like the let's say local culture on that and introduce changes that people are willing to take and and are able to follow uh, so that it's not like a one small try and oh this is too difficult so i i i really think we need to do a lot of consumer uh, consumer studies and consumer uh, work uh, uh, aimed to consumers so that Make, making the change easy for them. Exactly, and the, I think you noted quite quite rightly that the the cultural heritage uh, that we have and that we all um, carry for um, centuries, and you know, it really condition us in our in our ways. We tend to forget, and we say we are all modern, and we need to do things totally different. Mm -hmm. And probably it, there is always a balance uh, here to strike with you know all the heritage from the past and everything that that makes our cultures and our societies um to 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 have a a balanced diet in terms of health and in terms of uh, sustainability thank you so much anne maria it was great i hope you can stay with us until the end of our webinar um and now uh, i will ask even even um i will now would like to see you uh, sharing your presentation, if you can, and you're very welcome. And the floor is now yours. OK, just to confirm, do you see my presentation in presentation mode? Yes. Yes, thank yes, you. All working. Let's talk about how to get this done. Uh, I'm informed I have mission driven scientists and entrepreneurs keen to improve protein availability. So let's find out how European Innovation Council can support you. Uh, thank you, Claudia, for very extensive uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you for leaving me the most important part. Uh, you described past very well, but present is somewhat different. Uh, I'm now EIC Program Manager for Food Chain Technologies and Novel and Sustainable Food. Uh, my job is to create new challenges and manage portfolio of projects in my challenges. So let me share the story with you. How that's supposed to be done. I have only three technology slides. And I'm so glad. Thank you for inviting me and let's go. Modern agriculture, those green things are yeah, most likely plant-based protein. Uh, you know what's the production system? Monoculture uh, for years based on fossil fuels or machinery fuel, fertilizers and chemicals. So this green thing, that's a yield. Everything else is pest, weed, unwanted, and we kill it with industrial efficiency. So what, what could go possibly wrong after applying this technology and approach for decades. So plant-based proteins uh, tend to be uh, nutrient depleted, possibly contaminated with pesticides or residues. And yeah, maybe not just the most healthy choice. Okay, let's talk about animal proteins. 
I could ask myself what could possibly go wrong here. Um, it's environmentally trouble and brought animal breeding to bad reputation. But it's also compromised by a lot of antibiotics and hormones. So protein researchers turn to new page. Uh, Plant-based meat analog, cellular meat, uh, precision fermentation, maybe some new things. But all those technologies are still not refined. And I, I really don't understand our obsession that plant-based should mimic mouthfeel of the meat. Because plant-based is also whole cereals with legumes as a porridge, uh, not necessarily mimicking mouth feel of the meat. And there are some technology issues like uh, environmental aspects still and some other things. So how EIC could help you to bring those products to market? Let me tell you where we are. We are in Horizon Europe under third pillar and this uh, mark box, European Innovation Council, that's we. What we do, we have three programs only. It is Pathfinder, early stage development, really uh, TRL level one to four, grants three to four million euros, uh, intensity of support 100%. Once when you successfully conclude, graduate from Pathfinder, you are welcome to pursue in transition. It is already preparing commercialization. Again, grants, again, intensity 100%, a uh, little less money. And then accelerator. First two were for research institutions. Accelerator is for SMEs. SMEs who are single applicants, eligible for blended financing, meaning uh, they could opt for grant only 2.5 million euros, but it might be interesting to have some equity investment. And that goes up to 15 million euros. But that should be matched by private sources, at least one on one. So maximum support 32.5 million for mission driven, deep tech disruptive SMEs. And we have a little programs that would keep those wheels spinning fast and efficient. It's booster grant for Pathfinder, tech to market to transition and business acceleration services. OK, uh, EIC is well known about proactive approach almost on anything. So we combine successfully top down and bottom up approach. So for all those programs, we have open calls. You apply what you find appropriate for the call. But we also have top down approach. Uh, program managers are defining area of special interest of European Union. And then, yeah, I admit we are pulling out, you out of your comfort zone. You have to adjust a little bit, maybe amend your team, maybe expand the scope. But there is a return on that. Those are challenges for our work program 23. I will not say th those are more important than others but they are relevant for your research. It is Pathfinder Precision Nutrition, and it's Accelerator Nomad Technologies for Resilient Agriculture. So I would say you have 97.7 million reason to stay up to the end with me. Uh, how to apply? We have several cutoff dates for Accelerator and Transition, and one uh, for Pathfinder, one for Pathfinder Open, one for Pathfinder Challenge. That's our source of financing. So I'm so glad we are here in February. So you have still three open calls for accelerator challenges and both op open and challenge call for Pathfinder. Yeah, that's it. Uh, this is, I would, something I would like you to memorize well, because this is one of the key elements when you are deciding where to apply. It is about technology readiness level. 
So this is like that. You have research, development, and deployment. Our programs are positioned like that. There is slight overlapping. So please, check honestly, where are you on technology readiness level scale? Please, do not miss your program. Do not overestimate development of your innovation. Do the thorough assessment and avoid unnecessary mistake. So technology readiness level self-assessment is important. Okay, main characteristics. Are you really about something which has capacity cr to create new markets or disrupt existing ones? If yes, then you are possibly our client. I'm here to support you to create new challenges, but also help you once when you make the cut, when you become EIC beneficiary. So what we offer, this is it. We don't have much time to go in details about duties of program managers. Uh, so you will get the uh, slide deck in PDF form later. And my slide deck is actually much bigger than uh, it's deemed for 15 minutes, but you can go there and check some details later. And here we are. I am part of the team. Uh, my field, food chain technologies, agri-food, other guys, maybe relevant, maybe not. If you know other participants in those areas, please pass the information. Let them know there is already third year of EIC programs running. When I came to EIC, uh, agriculture and food wasn't really just frequent when it comes to beneficiaries. Low single digit. Food and beverage, 3%. Agriculture and fisheries, 4%. With those two challenges, we hope to see a radical increase in food and agri-tech projects in our portfolio. But let me tell you one more important thing. Those boxes represent possible improvements or troubles in existing food and agriculture. It is merely possible to fix one and claim we solve all the problems in food supply chain. Because forcing one thing would impact others, other boxes, positively or negatively. In many cases, it is even hard to predict how it goes. So pay attention. By applying to EIC, your project cannot have detrimental impact on other boxes. It goes beyond the scope of your individual application. So bear in mind, do not destroy other projects, other guys, or biodiversity. Okay, that's our portfolio up to 22. You see the most frequent projects were in food processing and packaging and quality of food and beverages. But all that was open calls. Challenge call? could be more or less everywhere, floating around. For 23, challenges are here and here. Novel foods, so I would say proteins might fit, but you have to be aware to position your project properly. It is not per se, I'm protein researcher and that's good for precision nutrition. Please stay with me up to the end to check that thoroughly. More about challenges is coming. Accelerator for SMEs. What's the goal? To develop solutions contributing to development of resilient food supply chain, resilient to environmental and social disruptions, but very, very carefully crafted. Allocated budget, 62.5 million. What is it all about? There are five components. Sustainable fertilization, crop protection under principles of IPM with focus on mechanical, physical, and biological measures, irrigation, soil management and protection and restoration, and crop livestock management. And all that heavily supported by digitalization. What could you do? You can research 
novel processes, materials, equipment, management practices, new strains of microorganisms adapted to harsh environment, climate adaptation need, and other things. Both challenges are defined according to those principles, holistic approach, life cycle approach, and to foster EU technological autonomy and leadership, paying attention to relevant initiatives. And then it is aiming to improve food security of the European Union, to reinforce our food supply chain. Uh, Pathfinder Challenge aims to investigate, provide scientific evidence of the role of diet in food-related health conditions and non-communicable chronic diseases. Let me tell you about Precision Nutrition Pathfinder Challenge. Yeah, we increased the consumption of protein. We find that out already at the beginning. Um, it is true, many people would starve to death this year. Uh, many would be malnutritioned, but almost 2 million are globally overweight or obese. And then significant number of NCDs is cause of that and decreased quality of life. And yeah, we have brilliant strategy. One size fits all. But that's already proven it, it isn't working well. And personalized nutrition, yeah, we are still far away from that. So let's meet at the middle ground. Feasible solution is precision nutrition. Significant impact and lesser costs like this. And then a lot of scientists are paying attention only to their subspecialization. They are compartmentalized. The whole idea is to do some convergence. So if you are about to investigate proteins, please pay attention. You include microbiome, glycome and epigenetics component because we would finance only those guys combining those three aspects, at least. And then, let me tell you about those food-related health conditions and NCDs. We would like you to investigate causal relationship among diet, microbiome, and glycans, identify food ingredients, food technology processes, additives, dietary patterns with the negative effect or positive effect and develop recommendations for the formulation of new food products and processes, uh, preferably with no or fewer additives. Remember, we are still talking about Pathfinder, which is TRL level one to four. It's far, far away from the market. Expected outcomes, understanding and establishing relationship that would enable prevention or and alleviation of the consequences caused by inappropriate diet. And then that should serve as a basis for development of novel foods and processes. Now the tricky part. I hope you, I have your undivided attention. It is essential. Like in most projects, your evaluation so far is based on excellence, implementation and impact. Up to this point, we have step two portfolio considerations for portfolio uh, challenges. It works like that. There are a lot of written materials, recordings, so I advise you to check that with more details. But portfolio consideration. Imagine 10 projects competing to solve just one non-communicable chronic disease. They are best, but they are almost like cloned. What would be probability of financing all of them? That yeah, pretty low. Because first consideration is to secure balanced portfolio covering a wide range of food related health conditions and non communicable diseases. So all guys researching just one thing wouldn't fly. Be aware of that. Then those projects getting granted should have common component, shared component. They should be complementary. Let me tell you more details about shared component. They might play with one ingredient, 
or technology process or additive. They could use a piece of methodology or biomarker, which could be shared by other projects. And of course, they could have a really ingenious approach, adding some additional discipline, which could give us a breakthrough progress. It is not what you could take from other guys. It is what you are offering to those guys. So you shouldn't be surprised. You should elaborate well in your application what is shared component you are willing to share with portfolio members. And then when we establish that, some reordering in excellence, impact and implementation rank list are possible. And then we would finance portfolio activities. So this is the part of the program that goes beyond the scope of your individual project. And yeah, we could just go quickly through that. It is about efficiently cooperating with others and preparing commercialization phase. Summary. Should I go for open or challenge call? And that would depend. Do you fit properly to challenge proposition? There are some differences. Well elaborated in this slide, so choose wisely. You might reposition your initial idea to make it fit for a challenge call. And there are some positive sides of applying to challenge call. Uh, be aware, if you opt for Pathfinder Open, you would compete with all applicants, regardless of the area they are coming from. So you would compete with uh, quantum guys, space guys, med tech guys, health guys, and it's a tough competition. If you apply for a challenge, you will compete with projects which are really similar to yours. You are competing with agri-food researchers. But let me finalize the presentation with some reasons why you should really pick EIC. There are 11 reasons. First one is state of the art evaluation. And let me be clear on that. Every feedback is a gift and we are excellent in giving feedbacks. Uh, don't forget, we are talking about entrepreneurs and letting you know there is a serious bug in your application could save you a lot of stress, money and time. But we are not mean. You get a second chance. You could vastly improve your application after first evaluation. And let's not pretend there is a grant. That's a serious reason. And it's big. Uh, there are additional grants, possibly several times up to 50,000 euros, with very special training, counseling, networking, that could actually make, make a radical change and set you towards success. Then equity financing. Uh, we would like you to be ambitious, breakthrough, mission driven. Yeah, but you would need a lot of money and we provide that. It is about guidance and support by program managers. So you don't have only project officers, you have program manager to support you in your mission. Then it is already proven. We are running program now in third year. It is about visibility, promotion and networking. It is about increased credibility with possible investors. And it is a special attention to women entrepreneurs, innovators. And then I already told you, uh, we give you a second chance to improve based on evaluation at the first attempt. If you are not suitable for our program, you might get seal of excellence and get some boost for other programs. And then there is possibility for fast track procedure. If such thing exists, if you find appropriate scheme, you could get fast tracked. And what to tell? 
Uh, I wouldn't like to make that a monologue, so I left some time for questions and answers. And in my opinion, that's always the best part of the session. So I will stop sharing now. OK, fantastic, Ivan. Uh, and thank you for sharing all the opportunities that uh, the EU is uh, placing on um, precision uh, nutrition. Uh, hopefully, we get some uh, some clients to you and you have served as inspiration from some technologies and from some entrepreneurs. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. I particularly find um, this one very interesting, which was how does the public opinion affects the development of proteins? And my, I would just add to this question whether you feel that um, the public opinion is something that is either hindering or facilitating the, the implementation and, and, and the emergence of new business and startups in the area of sustainable proteins. Do you think public opinion is actually does actually matter? And if it does, is it a, um, a, po a con or a, or a positive aspect? That's a very good question. And actually, it's not easy to answer, but uh, we are quite clear on certain elements. We are talking, if we're talking about accelerator, we are talking about businesses. They are offering products and services. So who has the final verdict on success and appropriateness of their products? Customers. And of course, customers are uh, the group of people who would determine success uh, of your business. Uh, recently, we had a enormous interest in plant-based uh, meat analogs, but that was exercised mostly by VCs, not so much by customers. And now we see that uh, some producers are in actual business trouble. Uh, so regardless of the VC community, businesses should pay attention firstly on their customers because they are key for the success of their business. So absolutely, yes. Uh, customers are the judge of success, appropriateness of your business. And, and even, do you think we have here a hot topic? Do we think we have here a bubble like we have witnessed in the past with, for example, the dot-com bubble? Um, or is this something that is coming to stay? I'm quite hesitant to use a bubble because bubbles tend to burst. So uh, I would not call it bubble. I would say uh, if we provide a decent product, which is not only attractive to investors, but also to our customers. And I noticed that uh, plant-based meat analog are mostly favored for environmental reasons, not so much about health benefits. So I would say we need a balanced approach. It should be environmentally friendly, but could provide also clear health benefits. Uh, environmentally friendly and healthy, appropriate. Then we could have a solid business chance which could secure success for their applicants or providers. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, one final question for you uh, from the participants. Can we apply to the accelerator if we, even if we were not previously financed by Pathfinder or transition programs? Well, there are Can two answers for that, short and long one. <laughs> Short one is yes. Uh, the long one, I don't know, do we have enough time? I see the clock, uh, it's already <laughs> late. But uh, frankly speaking, are you disruptive innovator? Are you based on scientific research? Are you at appropriate technology readiness level? Yes. Uh, it is not necessary that you are coming out of Pathfinder or transition. You could apply directly to Accelerate. Uh, where would you apply? I told you, check the challenge conditions. It would be maybe wise to position yourself into challenge, uh, but don't make mistake. If you are not fit for challenge, 
Uh, don't get rejected for making inappropriate application. Go for open. You can still apply for open even if you are not fit for a challenge call. Okay, great advice. Thank you. So very conscious of the times and because our speakers were so um, well behaved and they kept their timing of their presentation, I have a final question is slightly out of the topic, but I'm going to ask the three presenters um, to, just to, to tell us a little bit what they think about uh, insect based protein, because this is something that it's uh, fairly new. Some cultures adopt it um, very well. Others are very uh, concerned about uh, eating insects. And while you, you just give us your, your perspective, of course, coming from your background, technology, you know, health and, and probably some, some histories of the past or even some linguistic, what does insects mean? And also, would you leave some recommendations to, for our audience in terms towards, you know, sustainable proteins, healthy diets, sustainable diets? So two questions in one. What's your view about the insects as proteins and, you know, uh, a takeaway from you to our participants? Shall I go first? As I was the first in the order. Um, so on on insect protein, in, insects as a source of human protein, um, I was initially optimistic about this as a development, but the more I've learned, the less optimistic I have become. Um, I think, so Jonas House has done some fantastic research on the acceptability of these. And I think there's a few things that need to be borne in mind, um, which is that the insects which people are talking about um, and trying to commercialize are not eaten in any traditional cultures anywhere. Though insects are eaten in some places, there is no culinary tradition for any of the insects that people are actually trying to commercialize. And I think that's a problem. There's not that leaves no cultural way in to communicate to people how to eat these. Um, and the other concern I have there is that they could, by being used as animal feed, actually just end up embedding animal agriculture and increasing the consumption of animal proteins further rather than um, opening up possibilities for shift. So that's that's my current thinking on insect proteins, but I think clearly the um, it's still an under it we'll we'll see it's an underexplored space and i don't know what will happen um a if i had away. a single take yeah mm -hmm. single takeaway um concentrate uh, go do exciting research go do exciting research on how to get people to change their diets <laughs> and less on what they should eat but that that's my that's my particular opinion okay that's great thank you tamsin uh, and maria Yes, if I think uh, insects uh, nutrition-wise, uh, looking at the chemical composition, there's no nothing wrong with insects, and 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 they they would be nutritious. Um, so uh, as such, uh, from health perspective, um, insects would be just fine. Uh, but as Tanzin already mentioned, I think uh, also in Finland there's no cultural tradition to eat insects. And I think the uh, start-up companies who, are, who started with insects, uh, many of them have disappeared over the last two or three years. So I, um, I very much doubt that at, at least in, in our country, insects would, would become a mainstream food. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and the second question, um, <laughs> I would say that all in, in our Western type diets where we consume loads of animal protein, we have reserve to a little bit decrease protein consumption as in general and we have a place to uh, move towards more plant-based protein sources so and i would say that even small changes would be good even more small changes rather than no changes at all Yes, that's a, that's a fantastic advice. The, the, uh, well, in Portuguese, we say the pouco concreto e o possível. So the, the few, the concrete, and the, what is possible 
to 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 be made. So that's a good starting point. Definitely. Thank you so much. Even from the technology pr perspective, in no, I would rather go for a market perspective. So if you ask that question in Europe, yeah, it might be considered provocative. If you ask it in Asia, not so much because they ate uh, insects for long. Uh, Thompson is right, not that particular kind. So uh, that would depend on territory, but that wouldn't depend only on territory. It would depend on other options about affordability and availability of other options. If we are uh, missing protein source of other kind we are just used to have, uh, we might reconsider insects. So it is not standalone decision. It would depend uh, on ability of agriculture to maintain the actual uh, production level. If the unhealthy soil uh, po pollution drought caused the drop in production, oh, we would certainly have to consider additional food sources. And then that might be a second chance for insects. Okay, that's also a, a, a good point, even. And a takeaway from our participants that you'd like to leave? Well, now I go first. So the whole idea wasn't to scare you. The whole idea was <laughs> to inform you and encourage you to consider application for EIC Accelerator or Pathfinder. If you have any additional questions, uh, I cannot help you. I do not do individual consultancy. You should contact your NCP. Uh, but there is a lot of recordings and written materials. So the very basic document is Work Program uh, 23. Check there. Uh, there is Portfolio Consideration for Pathfinder available. There is a recording of general type of uh, info day. Go there. There is even recording on agri-food info days. So uh, there is a plenty of information available which could help you to shape and position your application just perfectly. So stay tuned, endure. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Ivan. Unfortunately, we need to, to, to close this session today. I would like to thank all our participants, our dear speakers, and of course, to the Food for Sustainability team. Let me just remind you that next week we'll continue the discussion around alternative proteins. This time we will have a focus on the role of the key amino acids on sustainable diets. So I hope to see you all again next week, you know, same time, same place. Thank you so much and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you.